long before four-wheel drive became an everyday sight in the country and the city, the Land Rover blazed a trail that many other makes and models would later follow. The early versions and their later iterations live on as the prized possessions of enthusiasts, such as the members of the Land Rover Club of Victoria, Australia's first four-wheel drive club. I've always loved them. Classic shape, classic car, never changed. I loved it so much as a kid that um, I remember just drawing that classic shape of a, of a Land Rover just endlessly as a kid. Landline joined the club on one of its monthly outings. Yeah, we're at um, Granny's Flat in uh, the high country near Jamison, the township of Jamison. We're out here with about 15 vehicles, um, Land Rovers, from the really early ones in the mid-50s through to the very brand new ones. Um, I think one is only about six weeks old. We're going to uh, go back the way we came last night through Jamo. It's all about adventure in the wide open spaces made possible by all-terrain vehicles. Definitely a love of Land Rovers and love of getting out in the bush, but I think more importantly it's actually coming together. It's hanging out with people that are into the same thing that you're into. You know, I, I love Land Rovers, everybody in this club loves Land Rovers, and we're just endlessly talking about them. And it has been that way for six decades. Also very much the social life. It appealed from a variety of ages. My parents had died when I was very young, so all of a sudden I had a whole range of ages with whom I could mix and get guidance and direction which I needed. Well, the club began in 1963 down in Oakley with an excellent motor mechanic and some friends decided that there should be a Land Rover club. Four-wheel drives, most notably the American Army Jeep, capable of moving troops and supplies across the most trying terrain, had become important and prominent during World War II. In 1947, the Land Rover was conceived in Britain by the chief engineer of the Rover Car Company and released the following year, which is when they arrived in Australia, with perfect timing. Gashes on the mountainside mark the early stages of construction work on one of the world's great engineering projects. The Australian government had just passed legislation to build the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Scheme, the largest public works engineering program ever undertaken in Australia. It took 25 years to build and involved more than 100,000 workers, many of whom migrated to Australia from Europe after World War II. These sturdy vehicles proved invaluable in the rugged alpine country. The snowy, at that stage, the roads were, in many cases, just tracks. Come winter, you, you would need a four-wheel drive. But I certainly know that the early surveyors who built roads, they were tracks, across the middle of Australia, they were in Land Rovers. For Australia's Woomera weapons testing program, for example, and they quickly became popular with anyone needing a robust vehicle. The farmers took to them like a duck to water and they became very popular in farming. And then um, in Australia, moving to the military, the Australian army latched onto them very early on. For outdoors types, it also opened up a new world of adventures. A lot of us were hikers and uh, cross-country skiers myself, but the Land Rover enabled you to take your family into these places and also some comforts of home. That, that's the main thing it allowed you to do. And you're able to get in and out on a weekend. And we were away about six months, did 16,000 miles in two vehicles. And we had a bit of a rough time, didn't we? No, I mean, we had a few breakdowns and Land Rover's rolling over and things like this. Everybody of my vintage can remember as a kid watching the Leyland Brothers. They all had Land Rovers. That sort of encouraged people to, to buy them and get out. They were the first of the real sort of family outing vehicle. With about 650 members, mostly male, the club is one of Australia's biggest four-wheel drive clubs. 
getting around the campfire is just as much fun and, and talking about Land Rovers as it is getting out and driving around. There's a very mixed age group and there's people that are absolutely labouring people right up to your very white collar worker and they've all got the same passion and it's lovely. The older versions, especially the earliest model, known as the Series 1, seem to cast their spell on everyone. The appeal of the club for me is that I don't have to drive solo. None of my close circle of friends are interested in cars at all. And it is an old car, it's 75 years old. And whenever I go into rugged country, I'm always a bit nervous about breaking down. So I like the support of principally the fellows in this club who, with a piece of wire and a pliers, can pretty much fix anything, sometimes a hammer. But as a female, alone in the outdoors in Australia, I don't feel particularly safe. So I liked the support and company of others. And they're all people who are like-minded. Right, so get out of I think they are classic cars. Maybe only we, the club, love them but makes me happy when I just meet one on the road. Bridget says there's often a team of experts on hand to help, which is more than a little handy when something breaks or bends in the middle of nowhere. It's a vehicle that doesn't have any electronics in the earlier ones, so they were very fixable on the track or in the bush. If anything went wrong, the average Joe Blow could get them going again. Pretty agricultural, but very reliable. Australian Land Rover owners and enthusiasts were pivotal in its evolution. Some of our members tended to hobnob with Land Rover's engineers in Australia, who were pretty receptive most of the time to suggestions. And uh, one of our members indeed had removed the complete rear axle assembly and replaced it with an assembly from a light truck. This solved the problem of eternally breaking axles, which used to plague us. I know I broke several in my first two Land Rovers. Back in England, Rover, the manufacturer, quickly adopted the much improved upgraded axle. Other modifications followed including a way of making axles watertight. Other little things like the air vents on tops of axle housings. When you have a hot differential and axle assembly, and you drive into a cold river, we were able to cross the river with water up over the bonnet, provided we took certain precautions. We used to practise on the Yarra River, I won't tell you where, crossing from one side to the other. One thing that's always intrigued me about these early model Land Rovers is the amount of aluminium used in their construction. I always assumed it was because it was lightweight and easy to manufacture. Well, it turns out the reason is much more fascinating. They were immediately post-war. So 1948 was when the first Land Rovers were, were built over in England. And there was this surplus of aluminium that they used to make the Spitfire aircraft out of. And so there was all this aluminium, and the only way they could produce these Land Rovers was uh, two things. One is use this surplus aluminium, so they made that. But the other thing is that to make the, the Land Rovers, they needed to make them for export because England post-war was, um, was very desperate. The economy was, was impacted pretty heavily as a result of the war. This is the first time that Land Rovers come back to Cuba, the home of Land Rovers. Cooma, New South Wales, the centre of the Snowy Hydro Scheme, remains the spiritual home of the Land Rover in Australia. Every five years or so, there's a gathering in Cooma, which is where the Snowy Mountain Scheme was, was together. And we had our 75th anniversary, and there was the biggest gathering of Land Rovers in the world. There's always been a friendly rivalry between this early British-made four-wheel drive and the other makes that have emerged. You had Jeep, 
uh, the Austin Champ and Land Rover. And then Toyota did come along. We had a member or two with the early Toyotas, but the early ones had a, a, only a three-speed gearbox, so we tended to look down on them. And I remember it as a kid. I remember my old man, he was in the Latrobe Valley four-wheel drive club. He was a Land Rover man. But we had um, Toyotas, the old FJ40s, and we had the, the G60 Nissans, the old Datsuns. And uh, there was a rivalry back then. They used to hang as much on each other and their allegiance to their four-wheel drive as they do these days. Yeah, it was fantastic, and it sort of lived through the generations. Like most car clubs, the older the member, the older the car they tend to favour, usually one that dates from their childhood. When my dad took me out when I was about six or seven, and we went into the snowy mountains. We started off at Quambat Flat, went across to Tin Mine Huts and out through Dead Horse Gap. So that left a lasting impression on me. Justin Burney's passion is a Series 110, known as a Parenti. Named after a Central Australian sand goanna, it was made for the Australian Army and partly manufactured and assembled in Australia during the 1980s and 90s. We've got quite a few of those um, in the club. The military's been offloading those for the last decade or so. They're really capable vehicle. They're really basic, easy to fix. I seem to want to fix mine every time I go out in the bush. Some people say that, that I tend to do my maintenance on the side of the track and not at home. That's supposed to be straight. Uh, and that's just bent like a banana. Like many four-wheel drive clubs, the Land Rover Club has a useful side as well. Since the 1970s, club members have provided support to communities hit by natural disasters, clearing tracks or helping rebuild fences. We still go out and help the farmers after, let's say, fire and flood. A lot of what we do would be impossible with a conventional vehicle. So the, the Land Rover Club and, and I must say many other clubs perform a lot of this work. These days, four-wheel drives are everywhere. Sales have more than doubled in the last decade. And they comprise more than half the one million vehicles sold annually in Australia. The car company stopped making the classic shape in 2016. Which was a, a sad year for Land Rover lovers and the, the more modern looking SUV highway type Land Rover is the one that dominates these days. I mean they're a very capable vehicle still but they're a little bit too plastic for, for many of us in the, in the club. But Land Rover still soldiered on and, and soldiers on to this day. The camaraderie amongst early Land Rover drivers worldwide is amazing. These old stalwarts will forever hold a cherished place in the nation's cultural landscape.